My name is John Hargrove. I'm at the uh, South African Center for Epidemiological Modeling and Analysis at, uh, at Stellenbosch. And um, I want to be talking to you about what's uh, shown up on the, on the, on the board here. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, that was involved in, in uh, putting this uh, great uh, workshop together, Christian in particular, and Jacek, um, and for inviting me, and uh, also to Ames for um, putting, uh, having us here, which is really great. So, um, I, uh, when I was uh, a little boy, um, which was very many years ago, there used to be lots of movies about the Wild West, or where Bill Gates lives. And uh, in those days, uh, they, they were about cowboys, and there would always be some baddie, bad Jim McCollum, wanted dead or alive, $500 reward, you see. And there were bounty hunters who went out to, and, and would bring back uh, bad Jim McCollum uh, and get their, their bounty. So uh, we're going to have a bit of bounty hunting here, and we're going to do it uh, in a game called word, word Association. Do people know about Word Association? So if I give you a word, you give me some other word. And this is just for students, OK? I want you to give me a word. OK, so if I say, for instance, to give you an example, if you've never played this before, if I say Adam, you might say? Eve. Eve. All right, OK. You're not a student, so shut up. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so I, I say Adam, somebody says Eve, what, other, what else might you say? Apple. Apple, well done. Garden. Sorry? Garden. garden, garden, yeah. And garden leads to Eden, something like that. All right, that's very good. So if I say uh, Clinton? Bill. 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 All right, oh, what about Hillary? Hillary. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, and, uh, and then I say to you, if I say, students, malaria. Who said it first? No, Abba, you, you're not a student. Who was the first one? It was you. OK, you, you won the bounty. So well done. <laughs> right, the bounty hunter. She got it. All right. So uh, now we, we'll, we'll play another game because what we've got here is a particular document um, which um, Bill Gates put up in 2016, which is talking about uh, the surveillance of the backbone of effective malaria elimination, et cetera, et cetera. And I can pull up the document, but I'm not gonna, you're not gonna bother, but it's about three pages long. So now we're gonna play another game. So we know the first thing that comes into our mind when we mention malaria is the mosquito. Everybody said it straight away. <clears throat> so, now here's the game, and all the students have to vote. So in a three-page document about malaria, we would expect, we might, it's only three pages, we're not going to have more than, than uh, many more than 10 mentions of the word mosquito, all right? So you can vote either more than 10, between 5 and 10, or between 1 and 5. So who thinks more than 10 uh, mentions of the word mosquito? What about between 5 and 10 in three pages? You have to vote, don't forget. All right, between one and five. He says one and five. Okay, between one and five. Anybody else? Who thinks between one and five? Okay, right, students, any other guess? Who said zero? Ah, what a great man you are. Really? Okay, so we're here we have, uh, how many more? The answer is, that in, that in three pages, when we're talking about, uh, the, about malaria, there is no mention of the word mosquito. All right. In fact, however, uh, later on when he's talk, uh, they were actually talking about this, uh, he's actually, in fact, now, he said, we are going to give 258 million uh, because we think this, this, this is so bad. And indeed now, we do actually have uh, mention of improved mosquito control techniques. Hooray! So actually, he didn't miss out. Maybe uh, Melinda said to him, hey Bill, <laughs> mosquitoes boy, listen, you know. But the fact of the matter is, let's actually look at what happened to the 258 million. 
And the 258 million goes as follows. We're going to spend 108 million on vaccines, that's 42 percent, and we're going to spend 100 million, that's uh, 39 percent, on uh, drugs, and then we'll spend 51 million on insecticides and bed nets. And actually when you look at it, it's actually for the development of new clever insecticides. The amount to be spent on mosquito behavior is zero. The amount to be spent on mosquito attractants, which might be important, is zero. And the amount to be spent on mosquito population dynamics is likewise zero. Okay, approximately. So it appears that of this huge amount of money, nothing is actually going to be spent to do with uh, mosquito biology, mosquito monitoring, mosquito population dynamics, or anything like that. Of course, um, they are actually spending money, hopefully, on better bed nets and one thing or another. So they are actually approaching. Okay. Now, the thing is, we know, going right back to uh, Ross and MacDonald, that they put the mosquito right there, and every, every model, including the ones that uh, you showed us yesterday, um, Abba, uh, they built the epidemiological models, they put the mosquito right in the center, okay? And so here's a particular one from Martin Zadell from 1995, it's just a nice picture which shows and they actually take into account what's actually going on with this mosquito. And um, they've been founded on uh, mosquito biology. Now the question is, what notice is taken of the predicted levels? Because out of these models must come a prediction not only of what's happening to the malaria, but also what's happening to the vector. And what do we use with that? Well, if we look at another one, this is now Lee Dale and others, and it's a more recent paper. And when you actually look at their predictions, what's going to happen in, in the future, what they show in, in, in East Africa is where we might expect to have worse malaria, slightly worse malaria, uh, and, and so on, right the way across. And there are a large number of these maps, I just picked one out. But there's nowhere any mention in the paper about what's going to happen to the, the, the levels of the vectors. Now, why would that be? And uh, well, just before I ask that question again, there's another one by Hoshin and Morse, 2004. Okay, similar sort of thing. Nice. Uh, uh, we look at, at what's happening to the, to the mosquitoes, but when they come to test the data, what they do is they look, this is actually uh, from my home country of Zimbabwe, they look at the way in which the model fits the number of cases seen in the west of, west of Zimbabwe, and it fits quite nicely. So it looks like quite a good model. But again, we've got no idea about how the predicted changes in vector population match the actual vector population changes. And the same thing happened yesterday when ABBA was presenting. What he showed us was a very nice fit between the uh, predicted number of malaria cases in Durban and the actual numbers. And he talked about the same thing happening in seven other different cities. So now, for the next competition, the question is, why is it why are we not told about the way in which, which the models fit the predicted data for mosquitoes, for vectors? Students. Say? No, I'm not a student. You're not a student. <laughs> Be quiet. <laughs> give me, give me a, whatever you, whatever, what do you think? You have to talk to me. I haven't heard from you. We got an answer, yes. Oh, is that Zinsler? You be quiet, I told you the answer yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 sir. Uh, I had to whisper that because there is no data. Because there's no data. You get half a bounty because somebody <laughs> told you heard the whisper. All right? They're, they're, basically, it's not true that there are no data. Certainly in the United States, people actually measure data. It might also be true, by the way, that entomologists collect the data and won't let anybody have it. All right? But uh, the, the bottom line is actually that people, in a sense, mosquitoes have been airbrushed out of the whole thing. They don't, we don't know about the... Um, and, and the same is actually true of an awful lot of vector-borne diseases. We think about the disease, which of course is extremely important. I'm not br brushing this under the carpet. But we don't actually think very much about the vector. Um, and there are two sides to the coin. Quite often, where we've got climate data, we generally actually don't have, any don't have any data about the vector. And sometimes when you have the vectors, we don't have adequate climate data. All right? So there's a, there are two, two things going on there. 
So I'm going to be talking about a case where actually, uh, with, for one particular vector, we actually have quite nice information on both sides of the equation for the vector, and I'm going to be looking at that. And it's in, it actually uh, involves the tsetse fly and the studies that we've done in the Zambezi Valley of Zimbabwe uh, um, over a, a large number of years. Uh, and um, I just should say that in case you say, well, in fact, you're just looking at the vector and you don't care about the, uh, the tr trypanosomiasis, uh, that uh, we have indeed modeled the control of trypanosomiasis. So we've looked at both sides using a differential equation type of approach. So we have actually done this. But what I'm going to be uh, concentrating on today is just actually improving the vector side of the modeling. And uh, so that's what, what I'd just like to, to sort of make it clear that I'm, although I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the trypanosomes today, uh, we certainly haven't actually forgotten about them. Okay, so tsetse flies, they're uh, these days um, uh, entirely uh, restricted to Africa. They occur nominally over a huge um, area, but uh, in, in fact this sort of uh, area is probably much more fragmented than is indicated by um, this, gr the, this map, um, but they at least potentially occur over a huge, um, huge area, 11 million square kilometers of Africa. And they transmit a, the disease called trypanosomiasis, otherwise known as sleeping sickness in humans and Nagana in cattle. So uh, they, are, they feed only on blood, males and females, unlike the mosquitoes. That's the only thing. They don't eat any nectar as far as we know. Um, and they basically uh, feed on, on humans and, and on other animals. Um, and they can become, this reminds me of the one where, the, the, the joke that was on the last slide of somebody's uh, thing where it's saying, pull out, pull out, you've hit an artery. It's because they take these huge, huge blood meals. And in so doing, they either pick up from an infected animal trypanosome or they can actually pass on a, a trypanosome to an uninfected animal. So it's the same kind of cyclical transmission as you get in, uh, for malaria. Okay? Now, unfortunately, I don't actually have a, uh, the, the, this, this, the process going on, but this is a, a female tsetse fly which has actually just produced a, a larva. They only produce one larva at a time, about once every nine days. And the larva is absolutely huge. It weighs, can weigh slightly more than the female, and it's got 50% more fat, uh, bigger fat content than she is. So, uh, it, A, it's, uh, it's a huge investment, which means they've got a very low um, uh, uh, birth rate, uh, which means, of course, in fact, if you, you only have to increase the, the death rate by really a relatively small amount uh, to, to do some very useful control. So, this is the, basically the way that it works. Um, uh, the, um, that larva which has, been, uh, which has been deposited sits under the ground we're gonna, at a variable time. Uh, and we're going to look at that, how that varies. Um, and it then actually emerges as a fully grown adult. It doesn't, the larva does not have to feed at all. Um, it emerges um, and matures, takes about eight, eight days. It, it ovulates and then uh, at some time, it's very seldom more than f at, as long as 15 days, around about nine, nine days, but it might be as long as 12, could be as low as seven, actually, it will produce a, a larva. Okay, so that's basically what's happening. Here we see the larva position, that's the larva just burrowing under the ground, it just sits under the ground. Um, the, the females, in fact, only have to actually mate once, they store all the sperm in the spermatheci, they can live for 150 days and producing a, a larva once every nine days after they produce the first one. So when the larva uh, buries under the ground, it, it, it forms a hard case. It goes uh, sort of red-brown and then black, and, and then it just sits under the ground and then ultimately pops open. This, this will all actually happen underground, and out comes the, uh, the, the adult tsetse fly. Now, the adult, um, uh, when it emerges, I mean, given the amount of uh, energy and raw material the, f the female has to put into the, the adult, uh, into, the, into its baby, it actually cheats a little bit. So it doesn't give the, uh, the baby the full amount of fat that an adult would have, and in fact it also doesn't give it the full uh, flight muscle. So the first couple of blood meals that the fly takes, it uses that to build up its fat and build up its, uh, up its musculature. Okay? So you can tell immediately 
that this is liable to be a slightly dangerous time for the baby, as it is indeed with, 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 with humans, with the same sort of thing, okay? It's a very vulnerable stage, and indeed for most, for most animals, okay? So, <coughs> the important thing to think about, in particular when we're thinking about uh, climate change and, and what we think is going to happen with temperatures, is that a whole lot of aspects of the dynamics of tsetse flies, of population dynamics, are markedly affected by, um, by temperature. So we know that we, the, the, the pupa is put into the ground and uh, it, it, come, it pops out a certain uh, number of days later. So for instance, at 25 degrees centigrade, uh, it's going to be around about 27 days that it sits under the ground. But if the, if the uh, temperature goes up, if we're getting up towards about 30 degrees, then it can drop down and it, and it sort of might be uh, as little as 20, okay? And if it went right down to 16, uh, it would be up right around about 100. Similarly, uh, just look at this, at this graph, a particular one here. This basically tells you how frequently the, um, the, the female produces offspring. How, and, and at 25 degrees, it's, as I say, once every nine days, it might get up to higher than that. It, if we dropped down to 20, it might be up to 12 days. Down here, it could be uh, down, to, down as far as seven. Uh, and using marker recapture experiments on an island, um, you can actually measure the, the, the mortality of these flies, and what you find is that there is, at least for one genus of, uh, of, of flies and one, one sex, as the, the temperature gets hotter, you also get an increase in the mortality. So what we see, if you, if you think about these, is what these are basically saying is as the temperature goes up, the birth rate potentially goes up, but so does the, so does the death rate. And in fact, uh, what also happens um, is that as the temperature goes up, the, the abortion rate um, actually um, increases. Now, again, I guess anybody can answer this. There might not be any more bounties. I don't know if I've got any left. But um, why, why would we expect these kinds of, um, of relationships? Why do they make sense? Just and pick anyone and say, I, I can see why that's happening. Do you expect it or do you not expect it? What do we know about um, tsetse flies in general, or uh, insects in general? They're Sorry? They're cold-blooded. Cold what does that mean, students? What, what, do, what does that mean in terms of the rate at which things happen? Sorry? Somebody said it. All right, well anyway, basically what we, we know is because these, uh, these flies are essentially, they, the temperature that they have is the temperature uh, in, inside their body is the temperature where they're sitting. If they're sitting in the sun, they will, they will heat up and uh, all, of the, all the, the life reactions will just happen much more quickly, which is why if they're sitting uh, in, a, in a very warm place, everything's happening much more quickly and so the flies um, emerge much more quick, quickly and, and so on. Why would it be that when, as it gets hotter, they die more readily? Anybody? Well, does it? I don't know that we die any more rapidly in Africa than they do in Norway. Not sure. Well, we wouldn't expect that. The interesting thing is that even when we go from 18 degrees, which is really quite cool, and, and up to 24, which we think is, uh, is a really quite a nice temperature, we're actually seeing that the, um, the mortality is going up, which is maybe quite, quite surprising. Sorry? They, they, they dry out? Something like that. Okay, well, one of the things, I mean, I don't know what, uh, but uh, w one thing is this, is basically every time, the, the biggest risk for this fly might well be when it goes to feed, because we don't like being fed on. Somebody try, f goes and I, and I try and kill it, and, and so do other animals. And, and when they're feeding uh, uh, and they're full of blood, they're actually liable to get predated. And if you're, the hotter it is, the more rapidly you use your blood meal, the more frequently you have to feed, and therefore the more risks you're taking. So you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, so... And similarly with the abortion, when it gets um, very hot and perhaps you're, you're having, uh, when it gets sufficiently hot, the flies are actually uh, taking refuge. They don't have enough time to find uh, food. 
and so they, don't, they can't physically push enough fat into that lava and they uh, don't want to waste it so they actually abort an egg or abort a small thing. So that kind of thing happens. Right. Now, uh, what we did say, uh, see in the previous slide, is there is a very nice, this is done in the laboratory, there's a very nice relationship between uh, the, the, the pupil duration and the time that the pupa stays under the ground. Okay. So what that means is that as you go through time, um, the pupil duration is changing because, of course, the, the seasons are changing. So if we look at, at the 1st of January, for a fly that's deposited as a larva in the, on the 1st of January, if it stayed at the, at the temperature that it saw on that day, this would have a 23-day interlobal period and it would come out over here. But as time goes on, it's now experiencing different temperatures so that basically, for instance, you go 15 days down the, the, down the track, now it's actually saying, no, no, you wouldn't have a 23 days. This would now be 27. So in other words, you cannot say when a, a, a lava is actually put into the ground, you can't say when that lava is going to come out until you know what temperatures it's actually going to be uh, seeing down the road. And this makes things rather complicated for doing, uh, for doing the modeling. Okay. There's another thing that happens, and that, as we say, because these are cold-blooded animals, the, um, the rate at which the fat is used, we saw that this, this pupa with all the fat in it, and it basically it's burning up fat uh, to, carry, you know, to, to fuel the, the metabolic processes, and some of the fat is actually being trans transformed into other bodily components. And the rate at which that fat is consumed goes up linearly with temperature. But the trouble is, what we saw was that the, uh, the time that it takes for, for the, uh, um, the fly to develop actually changes in a nonlinear fashion. And the, the consequence of those two um, things interacting is that there is a, um, a unique minimum to the curve of the fat consumption against temperature. So if it's too hot, the fly uses a large amount of, of uh, fat in order to compete its development, and if it's too cold, the same thing occurs. Okay? So in the middle, it's going to be good, and on the edges, it's not going to be so good at all. And if you actually, for those, with those same uh, experiments in the laboratory, what was actually found was, although what I showed was the length of time that it took for the fly to emerge, uh, actually, the, there was a huge mortality at each end. In the middle here, we're only losing maybe, uh, a, well, basically 96% of them are actually emerging. But as soon as you get up towards about 31 degrees, this is 31 constant uh, temperature, it goes huge, get to 32, and you're losing basically half of your flies will actually die before they emerge. Okay? In fact, they don't emerge at all, they die, sorry. Get down to 16 and the same thing, you're losing half of them. All right? So, what... Moreover, of course, what it's actually saying, this, uh, the, the graph we saw before, is that even if you do actually emerge, you're gonna, you will, uh, and it's rather cool or rather hot, even if you actually survive, you're going to come out with a rather a small amount of fat. Now that means you've got a, rather a small time in which you have to find a, a, an animal and feed on it. And uh, that is going to make the, this, this stage of the life really quite, quite difficult. Okay. We've got this as a, as a temperature, one could equally actually put, just plot this as uh, the pupil duration. So what it's basically saying is when you get, it's, everything is fine, when you've got a, uh, a pupil duration of around about 22, 23, 24, up to 30 days, it's, it's fine. As soon as it drops down below that, we get massive increase in, in, the, in the mortality. And the same thing when it gets rather too cold. Okay, so all of these things are going on. Also with microcapture experiments, which I did, uh, we were actually show. I think this is probably the first time anybody had ever showed in the field that, that, um, fly, that, that, uh, that an insect actually ages. So uh, what you can see, if you look at the, at the mortality rate for females, uh, here are the very young flies, the ones that have just come out, which are very short, of, uh, short on fat. They've got a high mortality rate. As soon as they've managed, uh, if they manage to get the first couple of blood meals, now they've got the full fat complement, they've got uh, strong muscles, and they actually do extremely well. Only as they get older, to sort of around about 70 days, uh, they start getting a little bit like 70-year-old men, a bit frayed at the edges, as you can see. And, uh, and so with the mortality rate, it starts going up. For the males, now it looks really quite different. They, they've got a, a, about the same sort of mortality early on, and it drops down to much the same level, but then it goes right the way through the roof. Now, why would that be? 
students. Why would it be? So what it's basically saying is for, for all of them for which we understand, the, um, we've got a high mortality rate when, in the young flies. But for the males, what happens is that that mortality rate increases much more rapidly with age. What do you think that's got to do with? Sex? Did you say sex? No. In my, in my classroom? How dare you say? <laughs> I like that answer. Give that man a bounce ball. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> right. It's just like young males, okay? It's about fast women and fast cars, all right? And so they, but basically, the point of, from the point of view of the selfish gene inside the female, that's saying, you take it easy, girl. You have got, you're only, you're only producing one offspring every nine days, so you've got to be really careful. Stay away from those men. Those men are really bad news, okay? Because they can swat you with their hand. Go and feed on an ox. It's much, much safer. But from the male's point of view, because the females only uh, mate once in general, he's got to find the virgin female before the other guy. So he takes all sorts of risks. And when you take risks, we know it happens. Okay, well done. <laughs> okay. So what we basically got for what it's worth, look, here's an equation, by God. <laughs> right. So uh, essentially what happens is you've got this, basically the sum of two exponentials, here and, and here, and they're just different for the males and the females. All right. So let's get into the field. Ignore all these dots that just came with, uh, with, with Google. But basically, this is where we were working. This is the, the Zambezi River. Zambia on that side. Zimbabwe here. And there's a a lovely river that flows into the Zambezi, which comes right up over here, and where it comes out of the, uh, out of the escarpment, this is Zambezi escarpment, uh, there is a research station where I've, just spe I've spent uh, 30 years of my life very happily. That's my house. Okay. This is in the middle of nowhere. This is the Rokomichi River, and uh, I'm going to be t talking about, oops, experiments that, uh, that we did. Um, you can see uh, from space these um, tracks that I put in in the early 80s, and we were sampling flies in and around all of, all of this place. Okay. So, um, the Rokomichi River looks like that for a very small number of days each year, if you're lucky. Uh, but generally, and, and under those circumstances, we've got sort of elephants wading around in the shallows and, and this lovely great greenery and everything like this. Looks very tough, isn't it? Tough place to work. So, <laughs> fortunately, they used to pay us a hardship allowance, so that was okay. Right, so, but for most of the year, it looks more like this, right? Elephant, buffalo, sitting in this very dry riverbed, uh, small group of female elephants, okay, so it's very dry and with limited um, availability of water. I must just keep a vague eye on the time. We don't want to go over time. Okay, good. So, uh, where was I? Right, so down at this research station, we, this is a, uh, a Stevenson screen where we've been measuring daily, there have been daily measures of temperature and rainfall. Uh, we just, for, over most of that period, wet and dry bulb um, uh, since 1959 and uh, with a, uh, a rain gauge there. Okay. Now, here we've got a stockade with, uh, made out of welded together railway lines. Why would we want that? Give you a clue, all right? When an elephant leans on a Stevenson screen, there's only one winner. So we have to, we have to enclose it in a, in a barricade. All right. So we have um, a long, long series of, of uh, meteorological data. And we've been doing uh, experiments on tsetse flies over that entire period. Not entirely. Uh, ne neither thing is, is, is complete because we had to abandon the station during the, uh, during the war. Uh, which led to the uh, um, independence of Zimbabwe. But for the rest of the time, there's, there's work being going on there more or less continually. Okay. So what does it look like if we, we plot uh, the year starting in July and ending in June so that we get the, um, the rainy season sitting in the middle here? So what, what happens is that um, temperatures peak in October, November, uh, drop down there uh, during, during the rains, show a small increase and then decrease through, through winter. 
uh, here, here's the rains, which uh, essentially are in the ma major rains are in January and February. And uh, if you actually look at the, at the NDVI, um, that sort of drops down rapidly. In fact, from, from, the, from February right the way through to October, it's going down. When the rains start arriving, then uh, NDVI increases quite rapidly. And we'll, we're going to use the, these data. Okay. <clears throat> now, what the data show is that, um, at least at Rokomachi, there has been really quite a, a significant um, increase in temperatures over the last 50 years. Um, the daily average has increased by an estimated 1.2 degrees centigrade from 24.9 to 26.1. All of this stuff, by the way, I should say is work in progress. Uh, my co-worker is Lisa Koop, who's sitting there, Lisa van Arden, sorry, uh, working with, at CSAG, uh, is doing the um, uh, meteorological analysis, and these are just my monkey sort of first approximations, but it, it looks fairly, I think, fairly convincing. We can see the temperature is going up. Um, while I'm mentioning co-workers, uh, Rashid Wifke uh, sitting there as well is working with me, and Top, Top uh, Jamal and, and Zinthle. So we've got four members of the staff sitting in, in here. Okay. So, uh, and in fact, um, that was the maximum temperature. The, the uh, the, the minimum temperature is actually, if I can see, this has actually gone up rather more, okay? Um, <clears throat> more marked. It's gone up by one and a half degrees from 18.6 to 20.1, okay? During, over that time, there hasn't actually been, the, if we look at this, uh, the line you would say, well, that's slightly negative, but actually there's no convincing decline in rainfall over that period, which makes it slightly strange, and uh, like a student to tell me, why would it be that what we're seeing here is that uh, we have got a, this relationship between here's the um, increasing in, uh, increases in, in maximum temperature and what we see is that uh, that's associated with a, uh, a decrease in, in rainfall. Why would that be? When we've actually shown that there's no change over time uh, with the, uh, in, in the rainfall and there is an increase in, in the temperatures. Why, why do you think we've got, we've got this sort of relationship? It's a correlation, but is there any causation there? You're allowed to say anything you like, because I don't really know what the answer is. What do you think? Nobody? Well, I don't know, but it, it might be, uh, we might actually understand it, because in fact, if you get a lot of rain, there's going to be a lot of cloud. And just the rain itself is actually going to bring the temperature down. So if it happens that you get lots of rain, then it's the, since you're measuring the average temperature over the whole year, then you might expect that you get this kind of thing. Anyway, that, that's it. But. So, <clears throat> now, one of the interesting things about this is when we actually disaggregated this data, it turns out that the increases in temperature are not the same across the year. If we look at the... Um, either the maximum or the minimum temperature, what we find is that for both of them, the biggest increase has been in October, November. Now you'll recall from the earlier graph that I showed you that October, November is already the time when the temperatures are highest. And we thought, and we reckon that we might already be in trouble there because we're getting close to the time where the temperatures are, are to the point where the, 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 the larvae and pupae are going to die because they're going to use too much fat. So it can very well be that at this time, this is going to be the real break point for these flies. That the, the hot season will be so hot that it's actually going to clobber the flies. Okay? So, yes? Why do you say that's trouble? Don't you want the tsetse fly to die? Not if you work on tsetse fly and, you're, and the tsetse flies have put <laughs> both of your children through university. <laughs> no, it's, it's trouble for the tsetse fly in this particular area. Uh, we, will, we will talk about what it means uh, more, more generally. Yeah, that's, that, you're quite right. Okay. Anyway, so um, that's what, we, what we're actually seeing there. So it's for both maximum and minimum, and therefore, in fact, the average temperatures, what it's actually saying is it looks as if it's gone up, you know, between 2 and 2.5 degrees. So that is, uh, that's really quite substantial. This is over uh, since 1960, let's say. So last 55 years. Okay. What has also happened is that there has been an increase in the uh, frequency of extreme events. All right? And these things, of course, are extreme important. There can be a, a temperature like this which doesn't kill us. 
the mean can be like that. But if it actually goes up to 50 degrees, you'll find an awful lot of people will die, even if it's only for one day, okay? That kind of thing. So we need to actually take these into account. And if there is actually also a sustained increase in temperature, then look out. So between 1960 and 1990, the 20-day running mean of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the maximum temperature, so we basically look at every temperature over, over 20 days, and we take the mean of that, and then we click forward one day and, and do that, and just look at the way that. It never exceeded 39 degrees. But since that time, since 1990, seven of the next 25 years, it is actually that 20-day that running mean has gone over, over um, 39, okay? And but in 1992 and 1994, it actually, the running mean actually exceeded 40 degrees centigrade. And that's, that's what it's over a 20-day period the average uh, maximum temperature was 40 degrees centigrade, slightly higher. It's now, since so many facets of the Tetsi population are, are uh, uh, controlled by um, uh, temperature, we might think that this is going to have some serious effects. So here's the actual graphs. Here's 92 and 94, when it actually got up to this huge thing. And we see also, when we look over here, in 2012, it got up close to 40 degrees centigrade. And if we look at the, um, the average temperature, which is what we're worried about, uh, there again, it didn't get above 32 ever until 1987. And now look at it. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, close 6, 7, 8, 9, close 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years uh, when it's gone up there. So uh, it's uh, really uh, the average temperature is getting sort of dangerously high. What also can happen is that on occasion, and in fact in 94 when we saw that extremely hot year, we also had a year when we had the lowest rainfall on record. Now, high temperatures and uh, low rainfall, how might that be expected to impact against students on the Tsetse population and how would it do? We know how the temperature might do it. What effect might the low rainfall also have? How might it affect Tsetse flies? We need to take a stick to the, the teachers. <laughs> Over here, I've been neglecting you. I'm sorry. Tell me why it is that, with that what, what might happen if we get ro low rainfall. Okay, you're also on the staff. But anyway, <laughs> I don't even like that answer. So we'll <laughs> They might indeed move. Okay, but what else? How, why might that, how might it impact on the Tsetse population? What do you think? Yes, somebody said something. Yes? You didn't want to speak? I'm sure you did, really. <laughs> yes? Right. Okay. But what effect might the low rainfall also have? Okay, I mean, that's a nice enough answer. Somebody else? There's no, no, I won't take away any chocolate. If you give a wrong answer, I promise, <laughs> you're allowed to say. What do you think? What, are the, what, did, what did Tsetse flies eat? Blood. Huh? Blood. They get blood. Where do they get blood from? Human. From? Human. Well, some humans, and somebody else said? Animals. Okay. What happens if it gets extremely hot and, and extremely dry? The animals might migrate, or they might die. Okay, so we, there can be another thing going on here, right? So there can be direct effects of the temperature on the tsetse flies, but indirect. I think you can just about qualify <laughs> for a... <laughs> Maybe I've run out. Oh, I've got one more. Thank goodness. Well done. Okay, so there might be a, a direct and an indirect effect on, on the tsetse populations. All right. So... Let's now find out what actually, we've, we've said what we think might happen, what do, does actually happen. And, and so unlike with, the, with the, the, the mosquito populations here, we have actually been looking at the number of flies we catch and we've been doing that in a different, lot of different ways right the way across the board. And uh, over an 11 year period, I sort of ran for tw 10, 20 days a month a trap like this for reasons which only God knows Tsetse flies are attracted to the color blue. They don't sit on it, but they react to it. And you don't see it underneath here, but at the black here, there is a, uh, there is a, a black panel. 
So having come here, attracted not only by the, the, uh, the color, but also by uh, s uh, some synthetic uh, odor attractants, which we've used, uh, they come along here, go in to sit on the black, and then come up and get caught in this bottle. So we put these traps out for two and a half hours every day and see how many flies we catch. Okay. Yes. Tsetse flies like nail varnish remover, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, and mushroom flavoring, um, and urine. <laughs> so there's no, seriously, acetone, uh, two phenols, and a, a, noct uh, a, a chemical for which we don't understand why, but it's one octene three ol, which is, um, is, is essentially used by, in the food industry as, m as a, a mushroom flavoring. So it was a serious answer, but uh, that's the more thing. So, and a lot of the work that was done uh, on uh, identifying these chemicals was actually done here by my co-author, Glenn Vale and myself. Okay. So, here we go. So, uh, this is done over between seven, September 88 and September 99 when I uh, finally uh, left the station. <coughs> and we've got a log scale here. So, this is one fly per day. This is 10 flies per day, 100 flies per day, and 1,000 <coughs> up over there. Okay. And we see the seasons. So, it's basically going October, 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 October right the way through over here, okay? And what we see is uh, from 88 through uh, 91, 92, it, of course, it goes down. You can actually see when the, when the, uh, the hot season, down goes the, the, the population here, down it goes over here, and here it goes down. But then in 92, that first year when it actually went over that 40 mark, this, you'd look at it and say, oh, well, that's a little drop. But this is a log scale. The population dropped in a single month by well over 90%. It was like a 95% reduction in population. Then, because they can actually still, they can breed fine, uh, the population actually uh, came back up. Uh, 93 wasn't quite so hot, but then we saw this year in 94, which was extremely hot and very, very dry. And down goes the population again and kept going down. And because there was another hot season in 95, and basically, the population never really recovered, and probably because it wasn't just hitting the flies, but it was hitting their hosts. So we've got a, um, a very big change in the population there. Right. And uh, as I said, the, um, <clears throat> the trend of increasing temperatures has continued, and in 2012, uh, the running mean of the maximum temperature actually exceeded um, 38 degrees. So that's over a 60, over a two month period, the ma maximum temperature averaged more than 38 degrees centigrade. It's really quite frightening. All right. So how should we go b about modeling this? And here's, um, and I'm, the people in this room who are mathematicians, your first uh, thing is we, your first go to is we go to differential equations. All right. And I, I'm not going to defend this because I'm not actually going to use this, but the kind of thing that we, you might want to do is say that the number of adults, change in the adults at time is basically some birth rate times the number of pupae which are in the ground, and then you're going to lose a certain number of um, uh, flies, they, uh, adults will get, which are going to die just as a function of temperature, and then there will be another lot that dies just as a density dependent uh, term which we need. Uh, Yasik's been telling us about that, and that's all multiplied by, by that. And that the number of pupae, well, we're going to have a certain number produced, the, 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 the uh, females are going to be producing um, pupae, um, and, this, they, and some of them are, be, are, are being born into adults, so we lose those from the pupil class. And then we have a mortality of the pupae and a density uh, dependent term multiplied by the total number of pupae under the ground. Okay. The important thing, as we've seen, it better be true that all of these things are actually functions of temperature. But there's a bit of a problem here, isn't there? And there are a couple of problems. As with these differential equations, essentially what you're doing is you're saying with every, every individual in this, in this system is actually the same. Or it's okay to take an average. But is it okay to be taking averages for the mortality here? Because actually, yes, over a large period of the time, for most of the time, actually we could say that the mortality is sitting around about over here. But this is where all the action is coming. 
And what we need to think about is you can have a mortality as low as you like over here, but if all your babies are dying, your population goes to zero. Okay, so we need to actually take account of that. And we doing an averaging over that sort of time is a bit of a problem. The other problem is that is this thing we go back to here that actually on any particular day when a, a, a lava is put into the ground, we don't know when it's going to come out. So it's very hard to talk about the, um, the rate at which these uh, uh, flies are going to be being born or indeed the rate at which they uh, sorry, emerge from the ground or indeed um, the rate at which they're going to be produced by the larva, by, by the female. We qu can, of course, on a particular day, we can say, oh, well, we can actually use the, the, the past um, information in order to figure out how many flies will indeed actually emerge on that particular day from using past them. But it's not easy to write down the kind of simple d differential equations which we all know and love so well. Okay. So... Um, uh, right, we don't need to, to worry about that. So, uh, again, I'm not going to uh, try to defend this, uh, this, this model, but basically what, I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, Glenn Vale, who's doing most of the modeling at the moment, no, stand, stand back a bit. Rashid Wifke is indeed uh, trying to use the differential equation approach using a uh, using delay, as Yasek said, at his, he um, likes to work on delayed differential equations, and he's, he is actually doing uh, his best to, to actually use a differential equation approach to, to solve this problem. But at the same time, uh, Glenn, just using essentially a very simple spreadsheet to give us an idea of where things are actually going, is basically saying, now what we actually do is we just actually follow cohorts of flies through time. Each day, they uh, click forward uh, one day in time, and they get one day older. And we actually look, we know what the temperature was on that day, so for that day, we know what proportion of, the, of pregnancy of flies are completed, and we know what proportion of uh, the pupil uh, development has happened in that. And by following that through, we can basically come up with an idea on any particular day of how many pupae have reached full term and are going to pop out um, that day, and how many uh, flies are going to be producing a, a larva on a particular day. Okay. So, uh, we're basically saying, if we've got NIT flies, so we've got they, they, these flies are I days old on, on day T, then on the next day, they'll all be one day older, and, and times more, move forward one day, and essentially, we're going to have this number multiplied, uh, this is be, going to be the number which will survive, and now what we're saying is that the mu is actually we, what we saw, is that mu must be a function both of the age and of the temperature, which makes it more, more difficult. And we must still have this uh, density dependent term, but now this will actually be multiplied by the entire population because all of the flies of all ages are going to be uh, competing with each other. Here's the carrying capacity and so on. And this will just be for the flies which are greater than day uh, zero, okay? Uh, and where this A is essentially the total of all of these, all of the flies in the population. What's the number of, of day zero? These are the ones which have just been born. So it's basically, you take the numbers which have, uh, on this particular day have, have re arrived at um, full term, and this is the number which will actually die off. And the number that will die off will be a function of how long it's taken them to, to, uh, to develop, i.e. The, the temperature which they've experienced over their whole pupil duration. So that's the kind of... Now, Glenn doesn't use any formula like this. He basically is doing Excel. But, of course, it, it's very happy for the more modern students to move into R or C++ or whatever. But that's basically the, the idea that's going to, um, to do it. So, essentially, what you're doing, um, you, you, you're actually adding up the, the development on each particular day, both for the pupae and for the adult flies, to see what your deposition rate is and your emergence rate of the pupae. So what's actually happened over the last uh, 55 years? And what's basically happened, this is a, uh, it's a, 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 a schematic, uh, it's a smooth um, uh, version of what's happened to the catches over all these years. But, but basically what we're seeing is way back in, um, in 1960, we think there were between 3,000, we're close to 4,000 uh, <coughs> Uh, sort of mean of 4,000 uh, flies, females per square kilometer of this particular species. 
and now we reckon we're down to around about 1,000. Okay, it's really dropped uh, uh, remarkably over this, this whole. Now, that's, this is not a, from the model. This is just a straight linear fit to the way in which these uh, the numbers are actually changing. When he actually does the simul... Uh, sorry, and then what we're basically seeing... So then what Glenn did, and again, uh, Lisa will be giving us a much better idea of what's going on, but this is basically saying if we actually take the data that we've got um, for the mean daily temperature between 60 and 2015, and we just actually take a linear thing, this is what we expect is going to happen to the temperature by 2050. Okay, that it will have increased by 2 degrees centigrade uh, since 1960, which does not seem outrageous given what we've seen has happened already. Um, but we, um, two things will happen with Lisa's um, uh, analysis. Firstly, she will put some sort of error bounds and give us a, what, uh, a, a hot version and a colder version, and we will have a, a, a better analysis of that. But just this is what Glenn has used, just to get a first approximation of what's going on. And so now he has actually used these, uh, these data with everything, all the stuff that I've shown you about how things change as a function of temperature. And what he's able to do is actually to get, until 20, uh, 2016, really quite a decent sort of, you know, halfway believable idea about what's happening with the population. That's on a linear scale. Better to look at it as, as a log scale. And it doesn't, it doesn't look too shabby. And what you essentially see is that things have been going downhill fairly from the tsetse flies point of view, uh, sort of fairly steadily until around about 2010. And then we've actually seen, and, and indeed in 2016, I can tell you that we're actually, we've got extremely small numbers of flies um, available. And the expectation is if things continue in this way, that actually it might well be that we could actually be seeing something close to extinction of the tsetse fly just by um, a natural, if you like, natural means uh, in the Zambezi Valley at this time. And it's certainly going to be a dramatic decline. Okay, that's what we're actually seeing. Did you have a question, Dave? Yeah, I was just going to ask you, is it, is it not a bit far-fetched to assume that the relationships will, will be the same as, as they have been? The relationships between what? Between birth and... and and death and uh, for the, you mean that you think that the biology, uh, yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, I think that there, um, I think it's quite possible we can d put this in a discussion afterwards, but I think it's, uh, you know, plastic effects, how am I doing on time? A couple of minutes? Okay. Um, I, I think that there, that, you know, that, that's a, a good one for, for discussion, uh, how the flies are actually going to react to that. So anyway, but essentially, yeah, the, what we, regardless of what, uh, what, we, what we do know for sure is that already things have dropped um, by, by 75%. This is on a log scale now. So we, even in, in 2016, we're actually seeing that there, there has, has been a you know, fairly severe decline. And the decline has been going on for a, for a, for a long time. Okay. Right. So... Um, what, there are a number of, of messages that I would like to get across. And I, we um, in, at, uh, at SESIMA have been involved uh, with AIMS and with uh, other people and trying uh, to train people in the whole business of uh, what, what we call the meaningful modeling of epidemiological data. And we have a, we have a problem quite often with uh, people and within Africa uh, where we have, in fact, as a consequence of AIMS, which is now not only in South Africa, but is in uh, various other parts of Africa, a blossoming of, of African mathematicians. And a, a large proportion of them actually move into the world of biological mathematics. And what we find is that there is a, uh, a as I say, a, a big increase in the, in the um, abilities in the world of mathematics. And that's great. It's absolutely necessary that you're able to handle the kind of mathematics that Yasek was talking about, differential equations, this kind of theoretical models. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Because if you want to be able to give uh, um, advice to the Minister of Health, the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of the Environment, you have to grapple with the realities of the data. You have to know about the biology. It's not a question of just giving a nod to the biology. 
you have to actually incorporate it in there. Otherwise, I think you're going to find you will get yourself into serious difficulties and you will be giving actually quite possibly nonsense advice on the basis of excellent mathematics linked to appalling biology. And so we do need to actually think about that. The other thing I want to say is that when we're, since we're, we are specifically concerned with uh, um, climate change, it, the central data requirement that we absolutely have to have, apart from all the biological stuff, is actually the climate data, both the current data and the historical data. Because if we don't understand the past, there's not, we haven't got much hope of, of predicting what's going to happen in the future. And the trouble is that the access, as we were told the other day, we've got, we can get free access to NASA data, but actually to climate data, which is happening in a place like Rukomachi, right there on the ground, when, where the, the, the experiments was, was done, is everywhere severely compromised. And even where the data are made available, access is often absurdly expensive. And it's particularly true in Africa. You will find that basically international organizations can afford the climate data, African scientists can't afford it at all because it is absurdly expensive and somebody needs to address this problem at the highest international <coughs> levels because it's severely compromising work in this area in Africa by Africans. So um, that is my one big message. I have to say that the modeling described here is, is very much work in progress um, and we would certainly like to extend the kind of approach that we've got to, to, to the vectors to um, modeling the vector and the trypanosome uh, at the same time. And we're working on that um, right now. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, this is my, my, uh, my co-worker, Glenn Vale. And just to show you one thing, uh, this, is the, this is 2016. I started working at Rakomachi then. And Glenn started working then, and we're looking forward to seeing what happens <laughs> here. <laughs> and, oops, that should have been one. Okay, thank you very much indeed to the organizers. Thanks a lot. Yes. And given that both ticks and cetify have this blood meal, right. has there been any um, <coughs> work done on looking at the competition between the two? Because they have to be in parts of Africa. And the impact on the animal, wow. they feed the host, and, and so on. That's a great question. Um, I don't know. i tell you what, but um, I've got one more. Great question. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Good the answer. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to give you a different answer. Okay. So uh, the big thing, we haven't talked at all about how you, how you handle um, tsetse flies. And, but basically what, I mean, we spent a lot of time uh, moving towards a, uh, an ecologically clean uh, way of doing things. That's what the, why we worked on those uh, odors. So we can actually, we've got odors which we can put out a small s a bottle and a sachet, and we put out four targets per square kilometer and we will actually be able to eliminate a tsetse population within a year and a half. Now, if you do it over a large area, so you can, yeah, okay. And then people realize that actually, why bother to put the, the insecticide on the targets? Why not just put them on the cattle? And in fact, if you spray uh, the insecticide on cattle just on their legs, under the backside and behind the ears, um, you can actually kill 85% of the, uh, of the tsetse flies that you would kill by spraying the entire animal. So this limited application of, te of insecticide is very, very big news. Okay. Now, the thing is though, even with that, uh, the we've managed to reduce the amount of insecticide we require by well over 99%. But you're talking about poor people living in extremely uh, poor circumstances and they don't like to spend any money on tsetse control. They, re they don't really care too much about tsetse flies. If an animal gets sick, if it's an important animal, they are, will give it a uh, trypanocyte to kill the, the things. But they're not prepared to spend money. But what they hate are ticks. So that's what it links with your... So what you do is you basically persuade them to use an acaricide, that's to say something which kills ticks, that also kills tsetse flies. 
So they don't think they're doing tetsi control. They think they're doing a, a, a tick control, and they get rid of the, uh, the, t the tetsi at the same time. I don't think there's a lot of um, competition. Uh, you know, the, the, the numbers of, uh, of ticks on an animal in general, they're, they're not going to actually impact on the total surface area that a, that a tetsi fly can feed on. So the density dependence, which I, I just sort of talked about but didn't really go into, can, when, if you see a, a really heavy, heavy uh, infestation of tsetse, you will actually see the entire hock of, a, of an ox covered with flies sitting like this, and the, the hocks actually streaming with blood. Under those circumstances, you would expect there will be competition for food between the, the flies, but I don't think it's so much between flies and ticks. I don't know if that's a reasonable answer. Yeah. That seems to be nice. Yes. So what's going to happen in countries where ah. the or Okay. Or yeah, I know. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. You, you've, uh, so basically, um, what Glenn is, uh, Rashid is saying is here what, it's, uh, what we're essentially saying is it's going to get so hot that the flies are not going to be able to. But what that means is up on the escarpment, when we get up to a couple of two, uh, two or three thousand feet above sea level, at that, uh, at that point, actually, it's rather too cool for the tsetse flies. So that's now going to move back into the range where it's going to be much more, um, you know, sort of much, much better for, for, for the tsetse flies. But of course, and people have talked about this quite a lot, we can't actually think about the, this, uh, and it comes back to Dave's um, point as well. You can't actually think about this stuff in isolation. I have talked about it in isolation. Uh, we're working in a, in a national park where, you know, maybe things are going to stay... Uh, the same, but maybe they aren't, of course. I mean, if the people move in with cattle, with insecticide on them, then it doesn't matter what the temperatures are, the tsetse flies are going to disappear. Equally, up on the escarpment, basically, with increases in population, the people have just sort of moved much, much closer to the, to the Zambezi escarpment. The game has all been killed. Regrettably, in, uh, with the, uh, the land invasions, etc., in, in Zimbabwe, large numbers of the cattle have also been killed. So, although from a climate point of view, it might be good for the tsetse flies. There may not, might not actually be anything there for them to, to eat. Or if it is, they might be spread. Okay, so let's have... Uh, do you mind if I... Let me take student questions first. Do you mind, Mark? Absolutely. Yeah. Just a comment that crossed my mind. There is a space agency in South Africa that is the National Space Agency, whereby they actually track the solar cycle of the sun. So there are cases whereby, let's say, solar flares, Whereby there will be a very increase in temperature at the same right. Which right. might also you know, affect the population of the tsetse flies. Right. So you mentioned something about the data. It's hard to access the data. Yes. To some space agencies. Yes. Do we have sort of an initiative whereby we should bring this sort of collaboration between. Uh, between the space agencies also? Right. I, I, is the, where is the uh, man from, is he gone, the, ma, the Na, uh, NASA man? Sorry, I've forgotten his name. Corey. I'm not sure, Corey, is he here? Corey. Uh, question about whether there's, uh, there is uh, cooperation between the various uh, space uh, agencies and similar agencies around the world? Right. Okay. You can discuss that with him as well afterwards. You had a question, I think. Yes. Um, I'm interested in the migration. Yes. Did you observe sort of migrations within the time, all this time, even up to now? Okay. Because um, I'm assuming that. Now that it is winter here in the south, right? How do those tsetse flies survive in that time? And for example, if you go to protected areas, yep. they are following, for example, buffaloes or elephants. Right. Uh, what happens when there are changes of temperatures within these? Uh, yep. Um, and then the tsetse flies follow them as well. What happens? Um, 
what we what we basically know is, I mean, it, it's clear that they sometimes will actually hop on a, an elephant and get a ride. But if you actually uh, if you actually look at the the rate at which a front moves, a tsetse fly front moves, it's incredibly slow. And they tsetse flies, uh, particularly the females, do two things: they go out and they find a meal, and then they sit for about two and a half days and do absolutely nothing and just sit there. And then they go and find another meal. And then they, uh, they find, uh, d d sit for three and a half. And then uh, after they've got a third meal, maybe a fourth, they go and produce an offspring. Then they go and feed again. And that's life. That's all they do. And they're, they're, uh, the, the mean rate of movement of the front is of the order of only two or three miles a year. So they're not like locusts. We don't see migration as such. We see diffusive movement with really quite a slow, quite a low uh, coefficient of diffusion. That's, that's the bottom line. Okay. There are some suggestions that it might be different in some particular areas, but in general not. And it's too cold for them ever for, to be done in Cape Town. So they, they basically, it's no surprise that the, uh, that the, the flies are in the, basically in the tropical areas of Africa because the rest of the world is, or the rest of Africa is too cold for them. They just, they, they won't survive. As soon as it gets down to 20, 20 degrees, the, uh, the, the, the pupae just don't, they just don't survive the winter, so they all die off. So what we typically find is that you get a sort of a movement up the escarpment during the summer and then back down during the winter and that kind of thing, but that's, that's about it. Yes. Last question. Yeah, I think, I think it's probably time, but uh, you, you, you're seven the chairman. Last, seven last questions. <laughs> Yes. I, I didn't hear that last bit. You mentioned that there are some pheromones that are attracted the Yes. What actually does the killing? What does the killing? Yes. Okay. Right, so basically um, we have a, a, a piece of cloth um, suspended on a, on a rod which flops around in the wind. It's got black there and blue over here and it's about yay by, by yay, and you just spray the black piece with deltamethrin, and the flies come and land on that black uh, thing, fly away, and, and a single contact with that is enough to kill them. Uh, you know, it may take a couple of hours, but they will die. So what it means is you, instead of spraying, as we used to do, spraying DDT across, you know, right across the, 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 you've got four pieces of cloth that size per square kilometer, and that's enough to do the job. And the same thing with the, with the cattle. You spray, it's a, generally a, a, a pyrethroid. De Deltamethrin is the, quite often the one of choice. Is that the answer? Yeah, okay. Last one. Well, I was wondering, in your model you had a density-dependent mortality. For yes. Others, and as a modeler, we all like that there is something like that. But yeah. biologically, what do you think that, that uh, which process is modeled through this density-dependent mortality? Is um, if you speak to David Rogers, who was at Oxford, he would tell you that the, the density dependence is absolutely, it, you have to have it in order to, to, to have yeah, stability. Really right, so he's actually done experiments where he took pupae in particular and put them at different densities actually in, in the soil and then went back 10 days later and looked at it and, and he did actually find some density dependent mortality. What happens in, uh, at Rokomachi at any rate, as, as the dry season uh, progresses, there are fewer and fewer places where the tsetse flies can actually put their larvae because they, put their, they want it to be under leaf litter or something like that. And when it, it comes to September, they'll actually go down warthog burrows. So we can find the, their, uh, the pupae much more easily. So presumably so can the parasites and also the ants. So we would expect that, in fact, what's actually happening, even though the population itself might be going down, the population density of the pupae in the, the areas where they're putting them is actually going up. So there's a very interesting kind of uh, dynamic going on there, which nobody's ever managed to sort out. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have any more bounty bars. It was a great question. Thank you. Well, it, I think the, the idea, though, is if, if you find one, then you'll find the whole lot. That's the point. That's exactly the theory. And it's yeah. Right. If, you, if they clump together. Right. Well, the jury's still out, so you may be right. But 
No, the, the jury is still out on Seti flows. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The point is, though, that don't forget the, uh, the parasites and the ants have been around for tens of millions of years. They may have learned, haha, September, it's time to, time to go and look in warthog burrows. And then they'll find them. So, who knows? Thank you. Okay. Thank you.